I, I've really enjoyed this uh, this workshop. I love IPAM. I've learned a ton. Um, I think that what's been challenging for me is that I've done a lot of things that are kind of tangentially related, you know, touch on in different points, but I've not done a lot of work like directly on molecules. And so I've been trying to figure out like uh, which things to to emphasize. But I think for me, I've learned a ton, so uh, it's been it's been great, and I uh, appreciate it. So um, I will start with this picture because when we're thinking about like emergence and scales, I mean it's a certainly uh, lots of examples of emergence here. Uh, you know, I guess starting in the middle with uh, matter that we know, and then learning about atoms, and then later le later learning about the structure of uh, of atoms. Um, you know, it, when we think about emergence, it, emergence it's often from kind of right to left in this picture, from like low fundamental things to something bigger. It's interesting the process in which we've learned about the world is often going the, the opposite direction, right? You know, so that kind of reductionist picture. Um, I don't actually know if there's a, I mean, I think of reductionism as more like the verb of how we find it. I don't really know what a great word is for the, uh, the equivalent, like the kind of reverse process of emergence, like that something simple reveals itself. I think that's kind of interesting. Anyways, the, uh, but uh, I think everybody knows about, you know, your, uh, everyone here certainly knows about electrons and, uh, and nuclei, and I think pretty much everybody knows about protons and neutrons. Beyond that, maybe not so many people very familiar other than maybe the word of, of quarks. Um, so that's like, you know, been my area uh, traditionally was doing fundamental particle physics. And, uh, and the way that the quarks and the gluons interact uh, to create things like protons and neutrons is certainly like one of the best examples of emergence that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we have out there. So, um, so when we think of these fundamental particles, this is this nice diagram uh, came from the Particle Fever movie. I actually made this figure. Um, and, uh, um, and, the, um, and these are the fundamental particles as far as we know. Um, so they're things like, uh, you know, here's the electron and then just the up quark and the down quark combined to make protons and neutrons. So pretty much everything you've ever touched is just different combinations of three of these things. Um, I guess the photon, you know, you've sort of indirectly interacted with it. You feel it when you feel the sun and things like that. Um, and then we think of these four fundamental forces over here, which, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I'm not going to go into this very much, but, you know, electro, electro, electricity and magnetism, you know, very well for chemistry, uh, but the strong and weak nuclear force is not very relevant for molecules, but uh, relevant for, you know, particle physics. And then uh, underneath it all, we think of these, these, part, these fundamental particles as being described by fields. They're quantum mechanical fields. So sort of like the electromagnetic field, if you go to some spot, there's an electromagnetic you know, field there, but now you sort of quantize everything. Instead of having a definite value, it's some quantum mechanical thing. And, uh, and the, the, uh, you know, we, there are some, a few mentions to quantum field theory, and I'll come back to it a little bit, but I guess one thing I can say that's maybe useful is that if you know quantum mechanics, one-dimensional quantum mechanics where you, you, know, you have like a, like a simple harmonic oscillator and you can move back and forth on a spatial coordinate is kind of equivalent to zero plus one dimensional quantum field theory. Like there's a point in space and, and the, instead of a physical coordinate moving around, it's like a field coordinate that's, that's wobbling. And so you get, you, know, you get quantization, you know, like raising and lowering operators and all those things, but it's like about moving what you're operating on the field. Um, and you do that locally and then they all couple together and you get waves and yada yada. Uh, but those fields also don't have to be like scalar values or even vector values. They can be more complicated things that, that transform with more elaborate symmetries. Um, and so I will touch on some of those in a little bit. So, um, so when you talk about the weak and the strong force, those things, there's like at every point in space and time, there's a, a local internal symmetry that, that sort of mixes together these different fields in some kind of way, and all the particles are related to this beautiful like uh, representation theory that we were hearing about from tests, but they're just like more elaborate symmetries. Anyways, when you do all of that and you, you really pack it into a very concise notation, uh, this is the Lagrangian for the standard model of particle physics. It basically, uh, you know, these different letters refer to the different, you know, the different kinds of, you know, particles here. And it basically is telling you something like the energies for some configuration of those quantum fields. And if you know that, then you, you have all the dynamics and you can basically, in principle, kind of predict everything. Um, it's very hard to work with uh, immediately. And so, uh, so one thing, one of the forces uh, is the strong force, okay, and... Uh, interesting thing about it is that the strength of that force depends kind of on like how closely you look at it or like how like the energy scale that's that's happening and if you think of energies as sort of one you know inverse distances 
uh, depending on the link scale you're looking at, uh, the, the effective you know, strength of the strong force changes, and that was the 2004 Nobel Prize uh, for the theoretical understanding of this. But here is the, that vertical axis is the strength of that, uh, that interaction, and then the horizontal axis is the, is the, uh, is the, uh, the energy scale that you're talking about it. So at high energies, like at the Large Hadron Collider, that interaction, so this is a quark right here, this is a gluon, this is like a pictorial representation for how those fields are interacting. Um, and so this is like the coupling of those two fields happening, and there's a coupling constant. And that coupling constant is what's being plotted there. And it's, it's weak at high energies. And because it's weak, it allows us to do like Taylor expansion. You know, so you can do a perturbative expansion of what's happening, and those get expressed in Feynman diagrams. So Feynman diagrams is the systematic, you know, uh, approximation of that, of that theory that I showed you before. But when you're at low energies, like nuclear physics, like the protons and neutrons you know, bumping into each other, um, that, that, uh, this coupling constant is large, and you can't do a perturbative expansion anymore. And, you're, and you don't, we don't really have any great way to do it other than to kind of brute force uh, the calculation and sort of just uh, go, go after it. So you, we say that the, it's no longer perturbative, um, and that, in that area, that's where you get all sorts of strong coupling and, and, uh, and emergent phenomena and the like relevant degrees of freedom are, are, it's sort of like going from, you know, electrons and protons and neutrons into atoms, right? You have, they group together and the, and, uh, and you, and the relevant degrees of freedom are now these like larger objects. And so that's the emergence that, that happens in, in uh, the strong force or quantum chromodynamics. Now, I'm going to talk about both sides of that picture a little bit and some other things. Um, since we, uh, this uh, is being you know, sponsored by the Julian Schwinger Institute, here's a great quote uh, from Julian Schwinger, who uh, you know, was one of the advisors of Feynman. And so uh, you know, they had a very different style. Schwinger was very formal. Feynman you know, liked it. was very, you know, well, he was brilliant, but he had the you know, pictorial kind of way about doing it. And the, this way of organizing the calculations made it like, much easier for people to calculate. So anyway, so... Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of breeze through this plot part because I don't, it's not really the, the I think the focus uh, that's the most useful, but it's, it's hard for me to not talk about it at some level. Um, but uh, so, so when, when, for a lot of the work we do at the LHC, we start off with, you know, that, that Lagrangian that I showed you, most of the structure is totally fixed by, like, by mathematical rules. You can only put things together in certain consistent ways. But then there are some coefficients sitting or floating around, which are like you know, fundamental constants of nature. Um, and these are what I'm calling these like theory parameters. So once you specify them and you know what theory you're talking about, it sort of dictates everything. And then you can use these Feynman diagrams to try to ask yourself what would happen if a couple quarks from like the beams of the LHC ran into each other and some interaction happened and this stuff flew out. Um, and so here, these would be like, uh, you know, electrons and positrons and quarks and stuff flying out. And this picture, you know, if you sort of, it encodes the quantum mechanical amplitude, you square it, it gives you a probability distribution that all these particles have certain energies and momenta. So it's that, that's what this encodes, is a joint probability distribution. But I don't observe these things directly. This is all happening like within like you know nuclear scale distances. These if these were electrons, they'll fly out, and I will see them. But the quarks I won't see. Um, and what happens to them is they will radiate more and more stuff, and 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 kind of spread their energy out until the energy gets lower, and then the strong force becomes does its thing, and then the particles group together into things like protons and neutrons and pions and yada yada. So all of this happens again like nuclear scales. You don't you're not going to ever see that. And then these particles go flying out. And then they smack into your detector, and so you see, you know, a particle like this. So this would be like, say, a you know, a proton that's or you know, fl flying along, and then it, scat it smashes into the detector and and deposits a bunch of energy through like ionization and stuff like that. And then we, and then the detector is just filled with electronics, and that's what you measure. Um, now, um, in that process, like as I maybe I should go back. Uh, uh, I don't know how to go backwards. Um, Um, in that process, th there, there are random variables here, which I don't observe, so there are latent variables. There's more latent variables here. Note that the number of latent variables is not constant. Like, it's, it's a variable number of things, so it's like this branching process, so it's r difficult to work with. When you hit the detector, also the number of scatterings that happen and all of that is, is random. So the number of latent variables for one collision at the LHC in our simulation chain is, you know, there's like... A, I don't know, hundreds of millions of latent variables for one to model one collision, and the collisions are happening 40 million times a second. So it's kind of a it's a it's challenging, um, but uh, 
Uh, and then finally we get something that's like a visualization of what we actually see with our electronics in the detector. And, and that detector, of course, is you know, the size of a building. Um, now there's software all along the way. It's very multi-scale. Uh, different people are experts at all the different scales, but there's APIs to sort of hop from one scale to the other. And you can push this whole thing forward, and we use Monte Carlo to do it. And, uh, um, and you can think of those Monte Carlo tools as basically implementing this integral over all the latent variables. Of course, you're never going to do that symbolically. No one's, I mean, I never saw anyone write out this integral as a graduate student. I was the one that started like saying, you should recognize that all of these Monte Carlo tools for our simulation chain are doing this integral. And once you write it out symbolically like that, you can start to reason in a different way. And you can start to think about, if I, ultimately I want to do inference on theta, the theoretical parameters, and I don't care about all these latent variables, I would like to say the probability of the data I observe given those parameters theta is the following integral, but like, you know, that's not, you can say it, it's not very useful, right? So part of the reason I'm mentioning it is that all of this kind of thing is, you know, is very similar to the integrals that you run into when you do like coarse graining at a, at a very high level, right? But do yeah. you have the, an idea of this distribution? Yeah, so you can, I mean, so you can, you know, we run the, we, we sample P from P of X given theta and all of the latent variables, and then we just throw away all the latent variables. And, uh, but X, you know, for the detector, the raw de detector data is like, you know, to, what is it, 10 to the, I should know, I just uh, blanked on which power we are. Uh, there's a, uh, yeah, 10 to the six-ish, you know, random number, like, a, you know, electronic sensors. So the, so, but we don't work with that fine level data. We have to, we have algorithms that will, I kind of want, was going to get into that a little bit. Is it like, let me show this, ah, having a hard time here. Is it in the end, you know, if this is say a photon, that photon just has like four numbers that describe it. It's like energy and momentum, it's going that direction. It hits the detector, it showers into a whole bunch of stuff. And what we do is we run an algorithm that finds that thing and then tries to estimate the photon's energy again, right? Um, but it is a little bit interesting when you think about the kind of uh, like atomistic to coarse graining. A lot of this stuff is kind of backwards. We start with something like the atomistic thing is like the native picture and it's like the, it's got lots and lots of degrees of freedom and then you coarse grain uh, to something that's not really there, right, and that has fewer degrees of freedom. We have a kind of this thing where we're sort of going backwards a lot of times, like there was originally this one simple particle. I mean, they're both really there, but, uh, but you know that there, in some sense this distribution is like conditioned on whatever that momentum of that original particle was, and that's really all I care about, right? So we, we typically try to sequentially kind of undo the process is how we go about the data analysis. Yeah. So, um Try to understand what you mean by one collision event. Is that really just two particles, like two protons? Yeah, so the, the beams are going around, and they're, they're not like a completely continuous beam. They're like grouped into bunches. Right. And so, so they, the two bunches come together and smack into each other, right. and there's a clock, you know, and, they, and it's at 40 megahertz. And everyone, every time they hit, and, and so there are lots them. of particles involved in one collision event. Uh, like you know, ideally, it would be kind of like uh, one proton and another proton would hit each other, and it would be perfect. But the, the chance of, you know, uh, you know, you might think, what's the chance of getting two protons to hit each other at all? It seems like very small, right? But we put so many protons in these bunches, at some point, uh, we got to, like, order one probability that every time the bunches crossed, two protons would smack into each other. And now we've gotten more and more intense. And so whenever these bunches come by, we have, like, 20, 50 proton-proton collisions, and they all get read out in the detector at the same time. So if you had just two protons colliding, yeah. why would you get so much stuff? Because it's just like three quarks per proton, so oh, shouldn't right. like so, so many things so I mean, that can happen, right? Yeah, so I mean, in that very first picture, this in the ideal thing where two, only two protons hit, even the, if you would pull like one quark out of one proton and one quark out of the other proton, that's what, these would be the two, and they would interact with each other, but through like E equals MC squared, you can produce a bunch of extra stuff. So like, you know, so all of this stuff could fly out. Like, so from the core interaction, you have, you know, six particles flying out. But then that quark doesn't uh, just go out on its own. It does this process. Like, after you make it, it, it showers, and so you get this, you, a bunch of stuff flies out. So it's not like a recombination from quarks from different proteins. Yeah, yeah uh, right, right, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so often this soup that you generate, right? Yeah. It follows thermodynamic rules, right? 
Yeah, so there, there are, in, in, in this regime, it's not very thermodynamic. It, when you, instead of colliding protons, if you collide like lead ions and stuff like that, then at that point, there's so many of these overlap. There's like a period where it's, it, it acts like a fluid and, and it's like actually a perfect fluid and that's the whatever the you know, quark gluon condensate and all these kinds of things that are like described the early universe. That's, that's more like, a, in some sense, high energy nuclear physics. It's a v very similar, but not really what I do. Um, but yeah, but in the proton-proton collisions, it's not so uh, fluid-like. fluid, fluid -like. Um, Anyways, uh, right, so there's a bunch of software. It's very multi-scale. Part of the reason I wanted to show it uh, is that you do these kinds of integrals that come up, you could think of, you know, one value of x is kind of like a coarse graining of all of that stuff that's going on, and I need to integrate over all the things that happen. So some of the technical challenges you run into have some similarities to, to what you, you know, see here. Okay, that just pictures the detector because it's hard to, you know, it looks cool. Okay. Um, yep, uh, it's very impressive. Um, one thing that's cool about it also is that the particles are still flying out of the detector when the next collision hits. So, like, uh, that's pretty impressive. Anyways, um, so, you know, I was doing that for until sort of 2012, 2013. I'm still doing it, but around that time I started trying to kind of generalize this stuff a little bit. And the, and the kind of framing that I've, you know, I've, I, I like a lot is just to kind of recognize that you have simulators all over the place. The way I think of it is that sim simulators, are, I mean, yes, they're software, but the way I like to think of them is, you know, they're probabilistic models usually of some sort, you know, or some mechanistic model for some phenomena. Um, they're also usually causal, so they're like causal generative models of the data generating process. And they're, you know, all over the place. Yeah. So the simulators are causal to the point that we know some of the equations that we use to build the simulators are causal. Yeah, and, and and oftentimes they're like, I mean, whether or not they're the actual real, you know, reality, you know, it's a very metaphysical question, but like there is it like literally in many of them a time step, right? And you're like following something and you see what happens after the next one. So there's and sometimes a very literally, you know, causal. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so like in my simulator, I could go in there and and I mean, that's one thing that you don't get, for instance, if you trained like a, a, like a deep neural network on a bunch of LHC data, is I can ask the question, what happens if like the power goes out in this part of the detector? I can re-simulate it and I can, you know, and, and, and you don't know that from like a deep neural network, right? Yeah. Oh, so I mean, the, yes, so simulators are causal in the sense that we can intervene and then we can see what happens, but the, that, the kind of causal mechanism implemented by the simulator may not be the causal mechanism by the Nature or something. And nature. Yeah. No. Absolutely. absolutely. Of course. Yeah. And and you know the, and then you know like that's uh, yeah. Does that discrepancy matter or should it? Is it okay? To well, I mean, at some point you're kind of you're asking uh, like you know what do you mean by theory? I mean, if you have if you have something in there and it describes the data well and there's some way to like do interventions both in the real world and you have a protocol for how to do interventions in your simulator and they match up, then at some point it's a very metaphysical question, but. In some sense, that's also kind of where I'm going. I think, you know, the ultimate version of this, like, uh, question about emergence and AI and machine learning and stuff like that is going to be, um, you know, if, you know, if it's not a human designed thing, like, what are the rules for, like, what you mean by this stuff? And, and to me, I think causality is going to be one of the things that you're going to want to maintain. But you're, it's going to be more nuanced discussion than what we usually have when we... Um, so maybe I'll get to some of that at the end. Um, Okay, uh, so, uh, yep, um, and then as you can imagine, if you're, you know, you know, I'm often interested in trying to do statistical inference, say, on the parameters of the simulator, uh, you know, learn that from data, but, uh, but more generally, there are these kind of probability distributions floating around all the time. You run into a lot of the same problems. As in, 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 uh. So here's like, I don't know, I'll show this one real quick. Um, this is like a desk toy, maybe you've seen it, you know, the, the bean machine or Galton board or whatever. So I'm just imagining, like, say you tilt it a little bit, the balls, are, when they go through, instead of being like left, right, 50-50, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be biased a little bit, right? So call theta like the probability that you bounce to the right, you know? And so what is the distribution of... Upside the, down, no? What's that? Is this thing upside down? Or? It is right now, but it's about to not be, okay. um, if it will move forward. So, so oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I took this video. So it it, it comes down. So what what is this distribution? Yeah, I mean it's sort of Gaussian. Like more specifically, you might say, like it's kind of it's a little bit discrete. And there's like you know, so you have some chance of going left or right. You just say there's like I don't know ten rows. So it's like a, a binomial distribution or something. 
So I taught this in my physics one class, and I was like, this is a binomial distribution, and then I calculated, and I was going to overlay the binomial distribution, and it's totally not a binomial, it's not the right binomial distribution, which I learned about like 45 minutes before my class. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was like, oh shit, you know, what's going on? And uh, so one thing, so, but okay, but you can imagine these paths that you're going through like as being latent variables, and then the, and the which bin it you know, lands in is like X, right? So you need to sum over all the paths, and when it's a binomial, because it's so similar, you can do combinatorics and you can do that sum or integral analytically, right? Um, I mean, one thing that you run into is that there's like the pitch of these things. Like, what if there's a different number of things here than there are bins there? Then it's going to be some annoying correction or something, but it's not that. Uh, so I took a slow motion you know, video of this thing. I thought it would be binomial. If you look at it in slow-mo, you see the balls are like running into each other. They're bouncing over like two or three. They're like, it is, you know, it's way more complicated. And because of that, you get a lot of like over dispersion from what you would expect if it was just like, you know, simple ding, 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 you know, Plinko style. Um, anyway, so I think this is kind of like, you know, I think of it roughly as like what's going on with some of like the DFT versus whatever. And if you know, like all these small effects, like depends on how accurate you want to be. Um, so, you know, there's no name. It's not named after some French person, right? It's, but it's some distribution. I can simulate it. Um, and then I want to do inference on theta, right? And so, um, and this is a simulator we wrote in one of these probabilistic programming languages that's, uh, and you can adjust, you know, you can try to infer the size of these pins and how much they bounce around. You see the aliasing effects happening and all that kind of stuff happens, right? So, um, so one thing when I think about like sim simulation and simulation-based inference is, you know, there's certainly sort of two broad classes between kind of deterministic evolution of a state and stochastic evolution. Um, and, uh, and what's interesting, and maybe I'll make some point later, is kind of when you go through like the different scales, the effective description, off, it, not only does it change like uh, from coarse grain thing to sm like sometimes it goes from deterministic to stochastic, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so the, uh, um, you know, like turbulence, for instance, you know, if you at some point you can't resolve something and you deal with it in some stochastic way, or even this, like is this a stochastic or deterministic simulation? Like it's kind of, you know, at the, the, if you just follow the balls are bouncing around totally deterministically and you have some random initial state or something and I don't know, you can, anyways. All right, now I'm going to skip through some of this, and then, uh, so this is one thing I wanted to show, is that in these, like, set of techniques, which I'm not going to describe for simulation-based inference, what you can do is you, you can run your simulator, and you get out synthetic observations X from your simulator, you know what value of the parameters you use to run it, and then you can try to learn some, you know, rela you know relationship, probabilistic relationship between them, so something like, what's the probability of X given theta, or what's the probability of theta given X, or you can learn like a likelihood ratio, like how much more likely is this observation for one value of the parameter theta versus another value. Uh, but one of the thing they don't, you know, the, all works, but it's it's not very sample efficient. And one of the things that we realize that you could do is that um, even though the the p of x is intractable, that if you keep track of all the latent variables, like the whole path through the simulator, you can often track the probability of that particular, you know, keep track of everything, like like in reinforcement learning or something. And and so uh, and then you can this t is like the gradient of the probability with respect to those parameters. So you, you can keep track of that, and then you can use it to augment the training data, and and you get something that's uh, uh, this is what statisticians call the score, but the gradient is with respect to theta, not with respect to x. And uh, and you can use uh, you can use this kind of stuff to actually improve. Uh, the learning, uh, the sample efficiency of the learning, and so it sort of goes, the data is just much richer, the training data and the labels are much richer, and so here's some example, like this training sample size, this is 10 million training examples, uh, and this is, is a logarithmic scale, this is a thousand, and this is some sort of like, how well are you approximating the likelihood ratio, and you see if you use this augmented information, you can be like just, you know, orders of magnitude more sample efficient. So I do think that there are places, it's possible that in the kind of, um, you know, molecular side of things that some of these tricks may not be used that could be, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, um, anyways, at the LHC it helps a lot if you can, if you can work with like the kind of the raw data and not have to work with like summary statistics that kind of coarse grain the data too much, then your, the ability to, these are two parameters of like some theory, 
and you want to measure it accurately, uh, and, it's a, and the simulation just assumes zero is the true value, so the tighter the ellipse, the more accurate the measurement. The, the traditional approaches that I see are these dashed lines and these kind of fancy, uh, you know, uh, uh, neural network, you know, based simulation-based inference things move to you from like here to here, which is like increasing the amount of LHC data by you know many factors. So th this was like a worthwhile thing to try to do, uh, and we're trying to do it now, but it takes like years to put it into practice in the real experiments. But that's starting to happen. Can you say yeah. what's the what's the intuition behind this improvement of sample efficiency? Oh, yeah. Is there uh, some covariates that you learn to exploit them? Well, one of the, one of them. This this thing doesn't go backwards. I don't know how to go backwards. Um, uh, the uh, one of the one of the points is that um, sorry, is that like if. If, if this point right here is, say, like the standard model of particle physics, you know, it's just some, and, it, and there's some distributions associated to it. And what I want to do is make precise measurements for like a small deviation away from it. If I move to a slightly different distribution and I want to resolve it with finite samples, I need a lot of samples before I can tell that there's a very small difference between it. But if for every sample I can say, oh, well, the relative, you know, the relative probability that it came from the standard model versus this nearby point and you can measure that with like no variance, basically. Like for each simulation, you have an exact number of how much more or less likely would that sample have been. Then you can regress on it, and it's it's uh, it gives you. Uh, I mean, there's still variance around, but like for each simulation, you have like some notion of who would have been more or less probable for a, a different scenario. So, um, but uh, yeah, we could talk about it more. I, I want to hit some other things, but. Uh, um, Okay, so switching gears a little bit, and I want to go through this kind of quickly too, is that at some point, you know, when doing a lot of this, you're doing some kind of probabilistic modeling and some, and some space, and part of the point is to work with like the original data, like the high dimensional data. But oftentimes, you know, there's this idea of the data manifold and the, data, you know, the, the points are not filling up the full data space. And so I would still like to somehow have like a, like, uh, like a GAN or something like that was, has this property that it models a data manifold, but you don't have tractable probabilities. So what we wanted to do was like have the nice things about you know a, a GAN where it's like the data is on a data manifold, but have tractable probabilities. VAEs are are sort of you know whatever similar, but they have also have difficulties with uh, with tractable probabilities. So um, and if you if you use a normal normalizing flow and the data sits on a manifold, you have this problem that it can get kind of infinitely thin. And so nothing really, you know, it behaves very well. And the other problem is that there's nothing controlling that it's the, the width of it is kind of the same along the data manifold. So if for whatever reason in learning it gets narrower over here than over here, you're going to attribute higher likelihood to these points than those points. And that actually has nothing to do with like their relative probability along the manifold. It just has to do with some, you know, how close are you squeezing to the actual data manifold. And so those were things that were kind of motivating you know, are thinking about it. And then, you know, in terms of like motivations for, you know, there's like we saw, you know, Lorentz attractors, or there's things like that happen in neuroscience. And particle physics, we have like energy momentum constraints and things like that, so that the data is often on a manifold. Uh, there's lots of good reasons. So we, what, this is what we, the picture we wanted is to be able to restrict just to the manifold and then model a density there. And uh, I will go, but we, the other point here is we don't know Generally, we don't know the density. If you know, I mean, if you, we don't know the manifold. If you do know the manifold, then there are, there are solutions for like the generalization of a normalizing flow when it's on a manifold. It's a little bit annoying because of the Jacobians you run into are like rectangular and so that you can't do the kind of fast tricks, so it gets expensive, but uh, whatever. Um, so the, the idea we had basically is to have a flow that's like a bijection from the data space to some, uh, you know, uh, this UV space. And then you just kind of pick, you know, some of the coordinates. Like, say, you want a five-dimensional manifold, so five, u is five-dimensional, and you know the rest of the dimensions, you know, are you kind of do a, like a, a level set there. And so you're you're going to just put a flow there. But when you go back and forth between the full space and the and the uh, and the uh, the latent space, then this this line at v equals zero defines that manifold. So you can kind of you know push forward, go back. And so here's the picture: is that you know, I can take a data point that's anywhere in the ambient space, so there's X, and then I can go through this, you know, bijection, the flow to the UV space, project down to V equals zero, um, ask what's the density for my lower dimensional flow there, and then I can push that thing, you know, uh, you know I go back to where I was, and then I can push it back onto the data space. And so you get both a projection onto the manifold and you learn the density of the points projected on the manifold. 
And so part of the reason I'm going through this is because I think there's this picture is pretty useful for thinking about a lot of stuff with coarse graining and stuff, and so I'll come back to this a, a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of show, uh, show that. There are some tricks about training there, which are also maybe somewhat relevant, is that as you change the manifold, if you're simultaneously learning the manifold and the density, it's kind of weird. You can't do maximum likelihood learning on the density if the manifold's moving, because it's not like just one likelihood. It's like a different likelihood for each manifold. And so they get kind of mixed up with each other. So that's kind of the picture here. If, if the, the, this projection is the, you know, if that's my learned manifold and the data is the actual data of manifold, you know, when you, when you project the true density is like the induced density is changing. So you need to kind of disentangle those two things. So you do have some like alternate, alternating training or something. Okay. Now, as promised, I would talk about quantum field theory, so I'm going to switch gear and go back to Q uh, QCD briefly. Uh, so this is like a kind of monumental project with a, a lot of people. It's, it's really led by the MIT crew, so Fiala Shanahan. Oh, this was a slide from her, so I don't actually... Uh, okay, I'll show you a picture of Fiala later. Okay, um, so, uh, but this is the rest of her group. We're also working with DeepMind, so Danilo and Seb, uh, Alex Matthews, and uh, we got two Alexes. Um, and then, uh, and this is my student, uh, Michael Albergo, who's still at NYU, and myself. Um, so going back to this picture, we were thinking about the strong force. Uh, at low energies, you can't do Feynman diagrams, so you, you, it's difficult. So what you do instead is you just imagine space and time. So you have to think about space time and you just discretize it, uh, usually onto a simple lattice, no like weird, you know, like meshes or anything like that. Um, so you have this space time lattice and then the data either lives kind of at the points of the lattice or more, more often actually lives on the edges, on the links between the two sites. Um, and so if you are, so what they often work, so it's 4D, so a lot of the state of the art things would be something like 64 cubed for the spatial part by 128 uh, uh, you know, steps in time. And then at each point you have four directions you can go, so four links. And then the data that lives on those links depends on the theory that you're interested in. But if you're doing the strong force, uh, the data that lives on it, they're, they're SU3 matrices. Uh, so they're, you know, complex. So you have like nine entries and, the, and then they're, uh, you know, complex. So, too. so you get kind of 10 to the nine numbers is the state space for, uh, for this thing. So it's pretty big. Um, so the, 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 actually trying to solve these problems, I mean, nuclear theory is where like Monte Carlo came from originally. And then Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo was also invented to solve this problem originally. Um, so this movie, you know, is a, is a time, you know, you're running through time, but it's, uh, this is just one sample of, of something like that, right? And so what we want is not just one sample, but we want to do a path integral over these things. So we need, you know, we want a whole bunch of them. Each one of these movies would be like a path in the state space. And, uh, and so for each path, there's an idea, you integrate this Lagrangian, you get an action, and you weight things by it's effectively a Boltzmann factor, but it's you know, e to the minus action of this path. Um, and uh, so this is very similar to what's going on in, you know, in the uh, and you know molecular dynamics and etc. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, these kinds of if the the predictions then turn into like expectations of some quantum operator on, you know, over these paths, and that's like not something that you're going to like directly integrate. Um, so lattice QCD works quite well. These are like predictions for masses of all of these, uh, you know, uh, what are called hadrons, the you know protons, neutrons, and and their cousins. Um, these are uh, this is like the prediction of the splitting between the the proton and the neutron's mass. Um, this is not really my area. I'm kind of a newcomer to all of this, but it works well. One of the things that I think is important is that. When I compare it to like what's going on, in, you know, like in molecular dynamics and things like that, you say like here's two configurations. I want to know the delta energy is you know something you know keV per mole downhill or something like that, right? You know, so the um, but it's uh, um, here you know, and you sometimes see some differences that are like reasonably large. Here you're trying to make a prediction, and if you see a difference to experiment, like you want to be able to say like, and therefore there must be some new fundamental particle, right? Like you know. And so it's like really, you're putting a lot of pressure on the theory to make like accurate predictions because you're actually trying to like say something's, something's going on here. So, so some of these predictions are like wildly, you know, precise. So, you know, like uh, 
whatever the gyromagnetic ratio of the electron and the muon, you know, these things are measured to like nine, ten digits uh, of precision. This is like the data from this muon G minus two uh, that, you know, that predicts how a muon, you know, uh, rotates in a magnetic field. And at some point, you know, to make that calculation, you have all these Feynman diagrams and things like that. But then there's a correction that you can only calculate with QCD, with lattice QCD. So, and that cor correction is like the dominant uncertainty right now. And right now there is some tension between the standard model prediction and the, the measured value. And different people kind of doing different tricks with lattice QCD maybe see something that's been better agreement. So this is like a, it's a hot topic right now uh, if, that, if there's some sign of new physics or if it's just that the, the calculations need to be improved more. Um, so in these things, they work pretty well, but one of the fundamental issues is that like th this blob, think of it as something physical like a proton or something like that, and you're resolving this grid more and more. Uh, so as the grid size gets smaller, uh, to do an update that's physical, you're going to have to do some kind of, you're going to have to change a lot of these things on the lattice. So you need some kind of big bulk update. And it's hard to figure out how to do that. And most Monte Carlo is more like local and diffusive. And so it becomes very slow, it takes many, many Monte Carlo updates before you make a relevant uh, change. And that's referred to as critical slowing down. And so this is like one of the fundamental challenges uh, for lattice QCD is how to like, you know, be clever and make these kind of big bulk updates in some more efficient way. So uh, Fiala, there's Fiala, uh, my student Michael and Tej wrote this uh, first paper that was trying to uh, use normalizing flows in a way to uh, uh, figure out roughly what this distribution looks like, make proposals for the configurations in a more like a, you know, um, uh, uh, uncorrelated uncor way that doesn't look like HMC, but you want something like a, a normalizing flow with a tractable likelihood so that you can correct for the differences. So you can either do important sampling or you can do, you make a correction on the kind of Monte Carlo MCMC update step so that you can kind of ensure that asymptotically at least everything is still exact. Um, right around the same time, a little bit earlier, Frank and Johannes and company uh, did the Boltzmann generator. It's basically the same idea in a, in a different context. Um, and, uh, and so this is one of these like very strong points of connection. And uh, I will say that our group has followed all of this work very closely. It's all very inspiring. Um, and uh, there's, you know, there, you know, I think there's been like uh, interest in moving beyond flows to other kinds of models. So we've looked at a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of other kinds of generative models. Uh, the difficulty for us is, you know, we still need to be able to kind of maintain, we need to know the probability of some sample. And so uh, for us, for instance, diffusion models are very, very expensive because you have to like take small time steps to be able to, and this trace that's involved and everything is expensive. So one of the other things that comes up here is that in the, in the space of, this is supposed to be the space of all the configurations. If you just plop down a, ge a generic, normalizing flow or whatever general model, it's gonna have some weirdo shape, right? Um, but we know that uh, there are certain degrees of freedom in this space uh, that are referred to as pure gauge, meaning that like if you go in that direction, you're making a change that's not really physical. It doesn't change any physical observable. And so uh, more concretely, the, the action is invariant to, the, to those kinds of transformations, and the probability is e to the minus action, so the probability should be uniform. So this is the picture you know, that we should have. The target looks like this. In some directions, it's just totally flat and trivial, and in other directions, it's non-trivial. The problem is it's not so easy to identify what, what those directions are or get rid of them in some way that, and there's also some, there's some play between this these gauge degrees of freedom and the space-time degrees of freedom. So if you, you, there is something called gauge fixing, which would basically just get rid of all these directions. You just would get rid of them, but then you would break translational invariance. And so, so you kill it. And so, so instead of, you know, uh, there are different ways you could do it, but the way that we've been doing it is to maintain these redundant degrees of freedom, but enforce that symmetry in the architecture. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, so anyway, in the process of doing that, you need to model these like crazy groups that happen locally. Um, and there are Lie groups, and Lie groups map on to, you know, manifolds like tori and spheres and things like that. So somewhere in there we built up some, you know, machinery for doing flows on tori and sphere. And I mentioned that partially because, you know, it's relevant for things like robotics, but it'd also be relevant for uh, what's going on in molecular dynamics. Um, so then I'm not gonna, I'll go through this kind of quickly, but basically here's this lattice, there's data living on all the links. Um, you know, you, you do these transformations locally at each point and you need to maintain this, uh, 
This, uh, uh, you want the model to be gauge equivariant, and if you couple that with a prior density that's invariant, then the whole thing is invariant. And so, uh, so these are the kind of whatever particle physics notation that the whole thing you know, is equivariant. Um, and uh, and uh, so, so the simplest thing would be like the, you know, for electrodynamics, there's a symmetry which is like a circle. So you start off with a uniform distribution on a circle and you want to flow it to something non-trivial on a circle. So this is kind of pictorially what you want to do. So you're going to have some distribution like this on every link. And, the, and that's what you want to do. And it's just, I'll just say again, the, the symmetries act at every point in the lattice. So it's like a, it's a, it's not SU3, it's like SU3 to the power of the number of points in the lattice. So it's a, it's a really, really big group. Um, so when we do this whole thing, this is like the autocorrelation time for uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo heat bath and the normalizing flow thing. And you see Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and heat bath get stuck in this observable in one spot for a long time. It's because there's some kind of topological nature to these fields and they get stuck in one topological sector and they have a very hard time hopping from one to the other. But the flow is bouncing around all over the place and you see the autocorrelation time is being you know, reduced by like factors of thousands. Um, so that was for a kind of a simple two-dimensional U1 model. Um, then we took the same idea and was like, okay, we want to go from things so like circles. Great. Yeah, yeah. So when you quote these mixing results, right? Yeah. Is there a guarantee that that's actually converted? Is there a bias in that result still? Uh, and, and, and the flow yes. one? Or is it oh, yeah, so if you just did the flow, it would, it would you know, bounce around like whatever, and it could be biased. But we add an additional step where we, and this is why it's important that it's something like a flow is that we, we correct for, like we do it like important sampling or we stick it in a, like a, a HMC with a kind of, uh, you know, a s proposal function that doesn't depend on the previous step. What do you call, uh, and, uh, and so we correct for it. So if the flow is doing a bad job, uh, then you will, it will develop an autocorrelation time. But because it's doing a good job, the, uh, it, it's a very small correction and the autocorrelation time so is still good. Yeah, so yeah, you could either think of it as, you know, you can either do important sampling and it becomes the efficiency, like the variance of the important sampling, or you can stick it into a Monte Carlo uh, and then it, and then it uh, manifests itself as an autocorrelation time. Does this flow globally working on the entire lattice, or are you using oh, I should have, yeah, so, a cluster move? Uh, yeah, so right now we, we don't have like a hierarchical kind of thing. What happens is that because it's all space time, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, invariant or whatever that we do like a convolutional structure. So the update that happens here is conditioned on like kind of the local neighborhood and then we sweep that thing over the over the whole lattice and then uh, so there's shared parameters and things like that. And then we've been doing a lot of experimenting on how to condition this in a way so that, and we do several layers so it has a receptive field that grows you know, uh, so the whole, you know, so there's like 46 layers of, I mean, they're gargantuan models. Um, the, uh, and so the receptive field eventually sees basically the whole lattice. So it has an opportunity to kind of learn a big update, but, uh, but we certainly, you know, could, things can be improved a lot, you know. Um, um, so the flow is still making global moves, basically, right? Um, so you're doing parameter sharing, so the parameters are not... Yeah, there's one part that happens, like there's this kind of, this, this is frozen, active, whatever, passive stuff, is that we, we want, to, when we apply it locally, we only update this kind of link, and then because of, you know, whatever stuff to ensure gauge equ equivariance, like uh, other things get updated kind of by accident, and, and we can't update everything at the same time, or there's clashes, so you can kind of only update like uh, the kind of gray areas, and then we do these like alternating masks and whatever. There's a lot of machinery that I don't wanna, yeah. Um, and then I'll just say that when we wanted to go from like things like circles to more complicated groups that are what are called non-abelian, oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, yes. this is maybe a quick question, maybe yeah. I just missed it. How do you initialize? So we, uh, you, like, I mean, you mean like, what, what is like the, the prior for the, the samples, or do you mean like the, the network itself? How is it? I just mean like, yeah, for, for the selection of your pages for that case. Like, is it, it seems like it would be non trivial to pick one. But. Yeah, I mean, we start out with the, the transformation. I mean, if you think of it as a transformation, we start out with something close to the identity that's not exactly the identity, or you don't get any gradients. Um, and, then, uh, and then we sample from the HAR, which is like the uniform on whatever, you know, uh, whatever lead group you want. Um, so, we, yeah. Um, and then, uh, and, and that's also a little bit of an issue because you run into these things like uh, that, you know, the actual distribution has like tails and things. So you get into this thing about the, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the gradients at some sense don't match. You're not really, you know, it's hard to get the right tail behavior. So then we've thought about using different kinds of priors to start to, but you know, it's, all of this is still kind of ongoing. Um, so this one, I want to spend a lot of time, but I'll just say that we wanted to be able to do flows on things that are more complicated. So like the, the manifolds that are associated to like non-abelian groups. And so if you're like in SU3, it's, you know, there are three by three matrices with, and the eigenvalues have to add up to one. So this is a plot of like the eigenvalues, they have to add up to one. So there's a constraint. So there's this two dimensional thing. And then you have like, you know, uh, the vial group and vial chambers of, of, of this group, which are these like uh, hexagonal things. And so you have basically some non-trivial density inside of one of these chambers that gets tiled around. But then doing this like that works, like here it is an SU9, which you can't, this is a slice through SU9. So it's something like this in high dimensions, it's got all sorts of structure to it. Um, so we want to put flows on that. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, it took a lot of engineering. And so this is kind of like this like process through the thing. And it involves like, you know, finding eigen decompositions and stuff like that. You want to be able to back propagate through this whole thing. So you have to like hijack the back propagation to do whatever. So there's a lot of engineering to make this stuff work. But this kind of, uh, you know, basic module allows us to work with essentially any, any Lie group. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we were putting all these pieces together. So at first it was just kind of the basic idea of like Boltzmann generator, then it was that with, with abelian groups, then with non-abelian groups. I showed you this result already. This is like the autocorrelation time being improved. This is working with multimodal distributions, you know, and making sure that that, that all works. This is the first one with a, uh, this is the first time we added fermions. Fermions get complicated. It, the way it's, fermions manifest themselves in this area compared to like, like polynet or something is a little bit different. It's more like the field itself is an anti-commuting number. That's a Grassmann valued number. And like basically people don't know how to represent those things on computers. Uh, and so uh, they have the weird properties that the derivative is the integral and all this kind of crazy stuff like that. So, um, and, but in the end you, you compute something that's like a determinant of a big mat Dirac matrix. And the way that we approximate that is like, uh, you know, <laughs> is uh, basically we have a surrogate Gaussian this big high dimensional Gaussian and the normalizing constant of the Gaussian computes that determinant for you. So there's various things like that. So this is the Schwinger model. Again, Schwinger comes up for the second time, you know, give, give props to Schwinger. But this has, this has, this is the basic model for QED. It has fermions like electrons. It's uh, one dimension, one plus one dimensional, you know, to time and one direction of space. And, uh, and they interact through a, a U1 gauge field. Um, and so then we've taken those ideas and put them all together and for the first time done actual QCD in four dimensions on a very small lattice. Sorry. Um, I will, you know, there's different approaches here. Uh, we're still trying to figure out which ones work the best. There are results from using HMC to the flows and things are working. Um, and, uh, and now the goal is basically to scale this whole thing up and we will run on Aurora, the big, you know, leadership class machine at Argonne uh, in, this 20, in 2023. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a ton of work. Uh, it's mainly by other people. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> but it's it's. But I've learned a lot about uh, about field theory. Um, were you, Alex, are you you weren't gonna say? So. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, I think I'm probably around time. I, the g going back, like kind of uh, a lot. So we talked. Uh, these are some just kind of random remarks I wanted to make. Kind of semi philosophical to end things, but. You know, in my kind of playing around with machine learning and physics, you know, you know, we talk a lot about inductive bias and a lot of the themes that kind of drive me are the, the following, you know, of types of inductive bias. Like one is sort of scale separation, which we've talked about a lot. Um, uh, compositionality, you see that a lot, you know, graph neural networks are great for that. Symmetry, we've talked about a, a, a ton. This is relationships kind of more generally sort of graph neural network line again. And causality, I think, is, is very important. Um, so there, this also is IPAM, you might recognize. So I was just sticking a little reference. Uh, Udo Pearl, uh, we, when one of the ones we organized, he came over. Luckily, uh, I reminded him on Twitter, he, he forgot he was giving a talk. And, uh, <laughs> he came over. Uh, um, I, I'm not gonna, there's various things about causality I'm not gonna read. Uh, in terms of scale separation and getting back to this context, you know, um, you have the scale separation and, you know, in time and, and uh, you see like, and space and you see coarse graining and things. And, and so here are just a few kind of random thoughts to, to end with. So one is that, you know, obviously when you have the different like scale separation, you get to different descriptions at these different scales, right? And when you talk about that, you know, the, 
at that, I, I hate to use the word ontology, but like at that level, there's like, what are the degrees of freedom or the objects, you know, are they, are they atoms or are they, you know, you know, beta helices or whatever, are they quarks and gluons or are they, you know, protons and neutrons, et cetera. So just identifying and naming the relevant objects at some scale is like historically been an important thing for scientists to do, right? And it's kind of funny, it seems kind of trivial, but it's like we should recognize that's already interesting. The other part is like figuring out, okay, now that I've identified that these things are there, like how do they interact and like is there some effective theory that describes them at that level? Also, like that's very significant, right? I mean, that's hard. And then the other part is like occasionally we understand how to hop between two levels, like how to relate the dynamics that's happening at one level to the lower level. And this is like, you know, Nobel Prize stuff, right? So like, uh, so I mean, these are, it's easy to say, but it's like, these are very hard to do. And, you know, the hope is that maybe the things that we, you know, humans have basically been doing this and, you know, what are the opportunities for AI to help at each of these levels? And, and I think it is very exciting. And I think part of this gets back to kang Yun's question a little bit earlier is that, you know, is this effective theory going to be causal or not? I think probably for it to work well, you're probably going to want it to, to be kind of causal. If it's going to generalize well to, and transfer to different kinds of systems and things like that, that's what you would hope would happen. And you see a lot of that in the, in the, what's the discussions here. Like, can I make my, uh, like, a, like this model works well, but it doesn't generalize to a different molecule. You would like to be able to do that, right? Um, so then, so that's one point. So that, you know, there's a question about like, okay, you know, how arbitrary or ambiguous are these different levels? For some of the examples that we have, they seem very unambiguous, right? Like atoms are, you know, atoms are there, protons and <laughs> neutrons and electrons seem like a very different scale. You know, uh, for molecules, there's a lot in the middle where it's like not, it's a, you know, I think there's many choices to probably to be made. Um, and you get into a little bit of a question of, uh, you know, even once you identify them, like what's the right way of describing their interactions, how much ambiguity is left there. It certainly seems like looking at all the different like ways of doing DFT and blah, blah, like, even there, there's some kind of flexibility, you know. Um, and then they get into the question of, okay, what kind of principles do we have that are going to help us? Like, if we're going to try to automate this thing, we're going to need to kind of have, like, a loss function or something to optimize. And I know that, like, Frank and Cecilia and stuff have done a lot in terms of variational principles for, like, you know, this is a, a good way to try to do it. But that's for, like, kind of specific problems. More generally, you know, who knows. Um, there's also this part that in terms of the, when you think of the, uh, like if you do some kind of coarse graining or you go from some like, you know, you know, complex lower level thing to some higher level one, there's typically fewer degrees of freedom. And so if I think about whatever the dynamics are on the, the coarse grained fewer degree of freedom emergent model and I kind of project it back into the lower level thing, that is basically like a data manifold picture, right? And, uh, and so I think that um, thinking about the geometry of that is, is maybe a useful guide, and I guess lots of people are probably already doing that, but it's in some places maybe not so obvious to think of it geometrically, so, but I think it's probably useful. Um, so here was just some example, like the autoencoder takes high dimensional data and you know, projects it onto, onto some manifold. If you, if you train it with just like L2 type reconstruction loss, you know, it's doing its best to learn a data manifold, but also the stuff that it throws out, it's kind of not really clear what information you lost or if that's important unless you have like perfect reconstruction accuracy, right? Um, so the... Uh, um, you shouldn't reconstruct, you should, recon you should predict the future. Right? I, think, I think that's core, that's what, that's what we do in some sense, right? I mean, if you, if you can't predict the future, that's the only relevant thing in some yeah, sense. Yeah, no, I, I kind of agree. That's kind of what I was getting at is like, the, if you just do the reconstruction, I mean, if, if it's perfect, fine, you didn't lose any information, you just have a smaller representation of the same thing. But like, usually you're gonna lose something, and then the question is, what, what, what do you wanna lose or not? And there's some kind of downstream task, like predicting the future. Is, I is would argue it's, it's, some, it's very, very important that you lose stuff, because that helps you generalize. In some sense, being good at generalization and intelligence is what to forget. It's, it's, it's exactly not keeping everything around. Right? Yeah. What's yeah. important and what's not yeah. important. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't disagree. I sort of think of them in two steps. I mean, one is like if I can throw away a bunch, like if the data is literally on a manifold and there's a bunch of like variables that I lose no information by throwing away, I just have a more concise representation of the same information. But then, but then separately from that, you might want to lose more information than that, you know. Uh, for generalization and etc. So, yeah, I, I would argue, you know, if you wouldn't, if you go down in dimensionality, you will by definition lose information. Right? Uh, well, that's that, the first part I meant is like if you literally don't lose any because the data is literally on a manifold, 
then you know it never then, is right i mean it, well i mean it's, it's, it's never it, done though. it means it means well, it's in, in it's an approximation but there's always noise and so the, the trick yeah, is no, i mean I, yeah I, I i said if right you know i mean so we have examples where you know the you, you do feature engineering you throw in a bunch of variables that are all redundant so they're literally you know the there's literally a delta function there, you know. Uh, but but you know the but yeah. I mean, generally, I agree with you. You know, yeah, the stuff that hits your eyes and your senses. Sure. Yeah. I mean, most. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you. I, I don't disagree, but I, I, you know, I was just I was kind of building up to that in terms of downstream task stuff, right? So, I mean, another part is like there's kind of general AI predict the future versions, or there's things that are a little bit more concrete. So, there's one connection that I think you know for me, I always think about like you know with my statistical background or whatever is that. You know, if you if you're doing if you have some downstream task and somehow you like say there's some kind of quantity theta that can be useful for solving that task, right? And and then in addition, think that I can like understand either a joint or conditional distribution between the data and that that other thing. Um, then, you know, then you can get into a question of like okay, now can I find like a, a you know a, a statistic or a, you know whatever some function t that takes the high dimensional data, compresses it, throws away a bunch of stuff, but it's going to be useful for doing my task, right? And so and if you like, can literally write it out as p of x given theta and somehow you know how to use theta to do your task, then, then uh, you, know, the, you say a you know, function t is sufficient if you can say that the total joint distribution you know, factorizes like this. So t depends on theta, but the rest of the stuff doesn't, right? If you can do that, then all of this is like irrelevant for solving your task, right? So this is the stuff you want to throw away. Right, and then that's the stuff you want to keep. That, that feels like information bottleneck, right? It is. It is. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so and the, here it is expressed in terms of inf information theory. You're just saying that the mutual information between theta and t is exactly the mutual information between theta and all of x, right? So there's all these different ways, and for me, it's kind of gui uh, useful guidelines. You know how practical it is not really clear, but I will say that if you're in the neighborhood of like you know like you kind of. Uh, you know, of, of you know, like if I think of it like I, you know, I'm close by to theta and I have some kind of rough idea, like there is a mapping that goes like in general these t's don't exist, okay? But in in the neighborhood, this score function that I showed you earlier is the is the sufficient statistic, and so like if you have these kind of probability models and you take these gradients, you know, like the, they they can tell you a lot. They basically tell you how to project your data down to something lower dimensional that's going to be useful for you want what you want to do and then that can change so i think that like when you think about this kind of connected to like collective variables and order parameters and various things like that i mean to me like most of the order parameters are exactly this it's just written out like instead of in statistical language instead of thermodynamics but even the like uh, you know like reaction coordinates and things like that i think there's a lot that you could do with these kinds of pictures but anyways um, and then i don't know the last part were just some pictures that were kind of connecting back to the to the talks that we saw, Rafa had this one who's making the point that, you know, uh, you know, here you see that same thing, coarse graining kind of autoencoder language. If you wanted to map back, uh, if it was deterministic, it would be the, an exact data manifold, but you don't necessarily want to do that. You want to like generate that noise. Um, but it's kind of interesting because it's not just, you know, like the noise is not just arbitrary, you're like explicitly modeling the noise there, right? And so there's some, you know, early work trying to, you know, to do that. I think that's pretty cool stuff. Um, so you want this kind of stochastic map, and this I think connects a little bit to what you know what I was showing earlier with these like manifold learning flows and things like that. Um, also, like when we talked about quantum field theory, I, I guess I should have said it is that like when you do the path integral, you know Feynman style thing, you can go any possible path, but then you weight them by this action, and what happens is that you get uh, there is a classical path, which is like basically the data manifold, and then there's quantum fluctuations around that thing. Uh, which which are super small, and then most of the phase space has like basically zero weight, right? So this idea of like, can I you know, can I learn the manifold like the mean of the manifold or something like that? That's like classical mechanics, and then the fuzzy stuff is quantum noise around it. Is that important or not? That kind of depends on your purpose. But I think this there's maybe some some avenues to grab some of that insight and to like you know express some of this stuff geometrically. I don't know. Uh, Anyways, um, I think that's pretty much what I had. There are these cool videos. I'll just let them play in the end because uh, it's fun. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, when I looked at all of this, I think this Markov, this is another one I was trying to understand in this geometric picture. To me, these Markov things are more like clustering. Uh, but then when you think about the dynamics here, it somehow, somehow projects back into the original space. And I don't have the clearest idea of what that projection back looks like, but it also is basically defining some lower dimensional manifold. Um, and, uh, and also, like, you look at this coarse grain potential, uh, 
it's very much like uh, uh, that, what that, the density that the flow, that manifold learning flow is, right? Like you have a density in the high dimensional space, the manifold learning flow is projecting onto like the coarse grained coordinates. And then if you, you project all the stuff on there and I want to learn what's the density that's left over, that's like the coarse grained potential. But you know, these, these coordinates are like the coordinates on that manifold. So I think, I don't know, maybe everybody, all, all, everybody already knows all this stuff, but for me, that's what I was thinking about when I was listening. So, uh, so I'm sharing that with you. Okay, so thank you very much. All right. <laughs>